It's good to see you all this evening. Appreciate you all being here, especially for uh, our brethren visiting from Northside. And it's, I, I don't normally do this, but it is, Jeremy Betts is uh, standing before us as answered prayers. It's been just over two years to my memory, somebody can nod or not, that he's been able to assemble in person with the brethren. And we want to thank God for that and continue to pray on his behalf for his continued health and strength. Not only did he beat leukemia, but beat COVID while, it, while the boot. So, um, you know, that's, that's no small defeat, and that's thanks to God's grace. We just sung, Blessed Be the Tie, which the last work I was at, normally if they got led, it was because somebody was leaving the congregation. We were on good terms, that is. We, we sang it as our farewell song together, and and so memories come back to when that song gets led of the, we would sing that because no matter where these brethren went, no matter where they were moving to, no matter what happened next in life, that sacred bind united us all together. That whether they were going clear across the country or down the street, that bond was still there and would be inseparable. And that song really encapsulated the two we read before, sang before tonight's lesson, really encapsulates the theme of the letter to Philemon. If you want to open your Bibles there, if you can find the preaching letters of second, First and Second Timothy, Titus, and once that's right after Titus, the letter, short little letter of Philemon. It is the smallest of all letters in the New Testament, and it's one that probably some of us forget about it even exists. We kind of wave at it as we're on our way to Revelation. Um, and often it seems like, what do we do with the letter? Paul's writing this guy named by, name, by the name of Philemon, which the subject of the letter really isn't about Philemon, it's about his slave, Onesimus. And it's being handed, it's being delivered by the hands of Epaphroditus, excuse me, not Epaphroditus, but the same hands who delivered the letter to the saints at Colossae. Because Philemon hosted the church, it was in his house. And it seems by his character, he was either a pillar of that church, if not a church leader. Now, it's speculation, but he is a man of some standing in that church. And it's interesting that the church at Colossae gets a letter to be read for the whole church, and then the same man gives one letter to Philemon for his eyes only, at least at that time. In this letter, we... It's one of the great letters, too, because it pretty much blows the stereotype that Paul is a harsh, evil man that many of liberal preachers like to paint Paul as. No, this letter shows Paul, more than anything else, as a bleeding heart. Uh, he is one who feels deeply, and he shows it, and he has great and immense care. And so what we want to do this evening is read the letter. It's only 25 verses, and see what treasures we can bring out of this text that God has preserved for us and he has saw fit to include in our Bibles. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and uh, to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always, making mention of you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you, for Christ's sake. For I have come to, to have much joy and comfort in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order to... Uh, to order to you, uh, you to do what is proper, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you, since I am such a person as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful both to, to you and to me. I have sent him back to you in person, that is, sending my very heart, whom I wish to keep with me, so that on your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel, 
But without you, but without your consent, I did not want to do anything. So your goodness would not be, in effect, by compulsion, but of your own free will. For perhaps he was, for this reason, separated for you, from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If then you regard me as a partner, accept him as you would me. But if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. Not to mention that you owe me even your own lot, yourself as well. Yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you since I know that you will do even more than what I say. At the same time, also prepare for me a lodging, for I hope that through your prayers I will be given to you. Epaphras, my fellow worker in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristocratus, Demas, Luke, and my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So again, what do we do with this letter? What do we do with this letter to the man by the name of Philemon about his runaway slave Onesimus? We look at the beginning of the first three verses. We, we actually find out quite a bit about this man. In fact, the first seven verses, really, we find a lot about Philemon and those who are with him. Um, we are told of a, a sister and a brother in Christ by the name of Aphia and Archippus. Now, Aphia, we know nothing else other than what she has mentioned here, but she is a faithful sir, sister in the Lord who is active at the church Colossae. And we, are read, we have read previously of Archippus, in the book of Colossians in chapter 4 and verse 17. In fact, he's the man that kind of uh, helps us identify that this is the same church, the same member or a member of that same church. He is a man of some status because he's able to own property, Philemon that is, because he is able to own a home in which the church at Colossae can meet. Now granted, they may have been only 40 or 50 people, as was the case often in the first century, but nevertheless, he has one. And to that point, he is one given to hospitality. We look here in verse 5. He is, Paul has heard of your love and the faith which you have to the Lord, and not only to the Lord, but to all the saints. And not only that, but they have often been refreshed. In verse 7, he says, For I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Here is a man that really embodies... The Christian virtues. He is one who is considered a pillar in the church. He is one who is given to hospitality. He is one that seeks earnestly to refresh the saints and has a dear love for them and, and Christ. And it shows that the love of Christ is shown by how he loves and treats his brethren. And yet for our 21st century minds and our own historical experiences with slavery in this country, we are trying to reconcile this, this tension in the text. How can a man such as that own slaves? And we have to remember that the Bible is a historical text. And the number one rule about doing history is the, the past is a different country. They do things differently there. And ancient slavery was not as modern slavery. Slavery in the Greco-Roman world, slaves had some limited property rights. Slaves could work and actually earn their freedom. They could purchase it. Um, slaves actually had a number of rights that they were entitled to use, uh, such as daily time off and uh, certain uh, expectations that their masters were not to, for example, excessively beat them and, and so forth. Uh, but as Rome, for Rome, the most terrible, one of the most fearful things for them was have another slave uprising. So there were some concessions made. But even then, how, does this, how do we reconcile this? How do we think about this? Well, it was just, it was never condoned. Uh, excuse me, it wasn't condoned in the scriptures. It was just accepted, not approved of, but just accepted as part of the world that they lived in. But that doesn't mean that Onesimus goes back completely as he was before. Now, since Onesimus ran away, and I think there was some sort of damages incurred when he ran away, because we see at the end of the small epistle in verse 18, Paul says, if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, I've been told that it's not maybe, it's since he has done this, put it to my account. I'll take care of it. 
Paul's whole mission in this letter is reconciliation. Not just of a runaway slave to its, his former master, but now a, two brothers in Christ that have something between them. And that needs to be dealt with. That needs to be reconciled. That needs to be addressed. Because they are not living in harmony and fellowship as they ought to. There's, some, there's tension there between them. So he says in verse 8, we get through the greeting and, and, and we look at Philemon's character. And here Paul, I believe he's doing is not deceitfully or trying to win an argument here, but he's genuine in this. Uh, we would hope so. I mean, it is an inspired text. And he even admits in verse 8, I as an apostle would have the right to order you to forgive Onesimus. The apostles had such authority. But by way of Paul writing this in verse 8, it seems that it, would be de- it was deemed improper for the apostle to simply assert his apostolic office for his own preference. Because it was the apostle's preference, we see later in the epistle, that Onesimus would stay with Paul. Look in verse 13. Whom I wish to keep with me so that on your behalf... He might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. But without your consent, I did not want to do anything, so your goodness would not, to be, not, would not be in effect by compulsion, but of your own free will. Paul here gives up his rights as an apostle in order to appeal to Philemon as the brother that he is. He gives up his preferences in order to do what is fitting for Philemon and Onesimus, that they might be reconciled together. He says back in verse 8, Though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, I rather appeal to you for love's sake. Love and the heart are a central theme throughout this epistle. He says, I have heard of your love and faith, which is in you. He says in verse 7, I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, dear brother. The heart is mentioned again, or excuse me, love is mentioned again in verse 9. For love's sake, I would appeal to you, dear Philemon. And notice that the three times the heart appears in this letter, there's a connection to be made. The hearts of the saints have been refreshed. Verse 12, I'm sending to you my very heart. Paul views Onesimus as one of his children, like Timothy. It's his very heart that he's sending back to him. And at the end of the epistle, in verse 20, Yes, my brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Philemon has a practice of showing this great hospitality to the saints, of refreshing the hearts of the saints. Paul is sending his heart to Philemon. And at the end, he asks him, please refresh my heart, now identified as Onesimus. Receive him back. And what's the crux of this? We look towards the end of the epistle. We see here in verse 11, excuse me, verse 10, excuse me, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, who I have begotten in my imprisonment. It seems, and this is all inference, but it seems that Onesimus, when he left, did not leave on good terms. There was some sort of damage that's incurred, either through property or perhaps he stole something. But there was something enough that Paul knew about. There was a bone of contention between these two men. And he leaves, and he leaves as, gets as far as Rome. And while Paul is imprisoned, Paul is able to preach the gospel to Onesimus. See, Onesimus may have heard of Christ in Philemon's household, may have ever wondered what his master's doing on Sunday with all those strange people. He might have picked up some Christianese via osmosis, being in close proximity. But with Paul, he got the full delivery. He got the real deal. And so he runs away, and he comes to Paul, and he, he is converted. And through the, the mutual brother, Epaphras, Paul perhaps finds out about this situation. And once that is made clear, he says, no, this is is not right. Onesimus, you've been very valuable to me. We look here. um, In verse 13, he wished that he could keep it with me, so on your behalf he might minister me in my imprisonment for the gospel. 
Onesimus had went from a runaway slave to somebody who was involved in the work of the kingdom. It seemed that he was ministering to Paul. Again, might have been actually going out and working in order to bring in wages to pay for Paul's food and, and clothing and stuff while he's in prison. Also, would this include that he was preaching and being one of Paul's assistants. And anyone who's done any sort of personal work or work at all knows how great it is to have somebody there alongside you. At this point in Paul's life, he is not want for friends, but he would soon be want for friends. I remind us of the sad story of Demas at the end of the epistle. At this point, Demas is still faithful. Later on in Paul's life, Demas will have deserted Paul, having loved this present world more than what he was previously doing. I mean, look at verse 11. He was formerly useless to you. Well, why is that? Well, he's out of his household. He has no benefit. He is not there to serve or labor or anything. And on a more spiritual level, the man was useless in that he was dead in his sins, alienated from God. But now he says he's both useful not only to you, Philemon, but to me as well. Before he was useless to only one person, now he's useful to two groups, if you will. Why is that? They're both in Christ. They're both striving for the same gospel. Both can be useful to the Lord wherever they're at. And they're both now, all of them now, are in this great fellowship. They are all tied together with that blessed tie that binds us. That distance or time cannot separate. And this gets to the heart of the epistle. When we are in Christ, when we become Christians, it radically changes all of our relationships. Nothing should be left untouched. Nothing can be left untouched. The way you interact with your employer, your, 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 your schoolmate, your co-workers, your own family, it changes. You look at Philemon's character again. The practicing of hospitality, the love of the brethren, the, rec- the willingness to reconcile, the willingness to forgive, the willing to be patient, those were unheard of in the first century. And they're pretty much un- un- unheard of today. There's a reason why the traveling salesman no longer can be a traveling salesman. You knock at somebody's door, they don't want you in. They don't want to accept, take you in, do anything. If you break down the side of the road, I know we all have cell phones, but there was a time where we had to depend upon knocking somebody's door to use their phone. Now, yeah, no, don't, don't come near me. In fact, don't come on my property. So to find someone who's willing and open to extend the hospitality, to show kindness to the stranger, that's just as unheard of today as it was in Onesimus' day. So he says here, because now Onesimus was once dead, now alive, he is now useful, I've sent him back, I'm sending you back my very heart, so that you, Philemon, may be involved in this decision. Will, will Onesimus stay with me, or will he stay with you? Will he be allowed to work with me in the gospel, or do you have purposes for him back in Colossae? Hence why he says, without, I did not want to keep him without your consent, so your goodness would not be in effect by compulsion but of your own free will. Paul was convinced that Philemon, given the chance, would help Paul. He's been refreshed by him multiple times. He knows that he would be willing to serve and minister to Paul. And so he's appealing to this as well, that Onesimus has been able to provide what was lacking on your part. Much like Epaphroditus and the Philippians. He was able to provide what was lacking on their part in the sharing and the bringing of the gift for his needs. And I love how Paul brings in providence in verse 15. Seems Christians of all ages throughout all time have often speculated at the hand of God and whether or not it was involved in some sort of action or occurrence. For perhaps it was he was for this reason separated from you for a while that you would have him back for forever. But no longer as a slave, but much more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? Paul's basically saying that 
Perhaps this is why Onesimus ran away. That he could believe and obey the gospel, and not only would you receive back your slave, but you will receive him back much more than that. He is now a brother in Christ. And here comes that change of relationship. How often has Paul talked about in Ephesians and Corinthians about the relationship between slaves and masters, between husbands and wives, parents and children? It changes everything. And here, this relationship would have changed greatly because while in society standards, they would have been not equal. Philemon's the master, Onesimus is the slave. In Christ, what did Paul say? There's neither slave nor free, nor is near Jew nor Greek, but all are one in Christ Jesus. That has some radical repercussions. But Paul does not dictate what Philemon must do as a repercussion of this new relationship. He appeals to him. He knows he will do much more than what Paul's even asking. Um, he says in verse 21, Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you since I know that you will do even more than what I say. At the same time, prepare for me a lodging for a hope that through your prayers I will be given to you. Obedience by compulsion is the wrong kind of obedience when it comes to God. In fact, as one writer said, merely obeying an order would not necessarily elicit from Philemon the increase in understanding and the love for which Paul prayed back in verse 6. Paul prayed in verse 6, I pray that the fellowship, the sharing, the koinonia of, our, of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in Christ's sake. It is one thing to be told the correct understanding or the application. It is another thing to figure it out on your own and make the connection. This is why, you know, as parents, I will speak from the child's perspective. My dad and mom sometimes let me go off and do things knowing full well that there was going to be a disastrous end result. My mom loves to tell the story. I'm surprised I don't have more permanent markings on my hand because of it, but she said, I told you time and time again, don't touch that. It's a hot burner. It's a hot burner. Don't touch that pan. And what did you do? You touched it. Because eventually, you just had to learn the lesson. Now, I was not seriously burned, but I learned the lesson because I don't recall ever touching a hot pan after that incident. Sometimes you just have to learn the lesson. That's a negative example, but here, Paul was appealing to Philemon's better nature. The love and, and, and virtues that exist in Christ that he is embodying, he's appealing to that, that you need to treat Onesimus as your brother in Christ. Not as your, former, not as your property, not as your runaway slave, but as your brother who you need to reconcile with. This is why I believe what Paul is saying here when he says in verse 8, I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper. Christians should not have animosity or conflict or an issue where we cannot reconcile over. We spoke on that this morning, did we not, in Ephesians 4? What was the very first application of the, of the gospel Paul makes? That we would all be unified that we preserve the bond of unity and the, 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 the spirit of unity and the bond of peace. And Paul almost offhanded. He says, oh, by the way, Philemon, prepare my room. If the Lord wills and your prayers are effective, I should be with you shortly. I have the confident expectation that this will, be ha well, this will happen. And I want you to know also that Epaphras, my fellow prisoner, greets you, as does Mark and Aristocratus and Demas and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. For it's not by human means or reasoning that Paul or Philemon would reconcile to Onesimus. It's going to be by God's grace that this is going to be accomplished. And as I mentioned previously, but what are the takeaways here? I would give you one practical and one just to make us think. 
Well, the one to make us think first. I would suggest to you that Philemon, in a very real sense, is the gospel recreated in 25 verses. You have the alien sinner, Onesimus. He is alienated from Philemon, if you may put him in the place of God there. That's the wrong way of wording it, but Philemon is the offended party. Onesimus is the offender. And Onesimus in of himself is lacking any means of actually reconciling to his former master. He's run away, he's incurred damages. As far as Roman law was concerned, Philemon had every right, and Onesimus had every expectation that if he were ever to find him again, it would not be a pretty ending. It took a mediator, in this case Paul, to interject himself to bring about the reconciliation. And Paul embodied this so much. And it's not just Paul's trying to intentionally, I'm trying to be, you know, I, I think people need to see this picture here when I write this. Paul just embodied the life and teachings of Christ so much that this was the second nature to him. I have Two brethren that are divided and they have an issue between them. This is not right. We need to make it right. And the second more practical thing of this letter is this letter shows us how, again, Christ changes all of our relationships, radically so. How we all need to love each other and be and bear with one another in true fellowship. I would say to you that the key to this whole letter is verse 6. The fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is, in, for, which is in you for Christ's sake. Fellowship, koinonia, this great unity that we have amongst all believers. For every question the scriptures answer, sometimes they leave another question unanswered. Not that they're not complete, but to my knowledge, the record, we're not told of what happened when Onesimus got back to Philemon. But based on Paul's confidence that they, it seemed that they would re- reconcile, Paul was dead sure that this was going to happen. And they would not be welcomed back as simply a returning slave, but now he is a brother in Christ, fit for service in the Lord's kingdom. And we may, Paul may be losing a worker with him in Rome, Onesimus and Colossae are gaining a worker for the advancement of the gospel. If there's one here tonight, perhaps has not considered Christ, has no idea what I was talking about here in Philemon. I look out and I think most of us have, but maybe if there's not yet not one who has obeyed the gospel. Jesus made it very simple for us, made it simple for our benefit. The one who believes in him and is baptized, that is the one who will be saved. The one who does not believe in Christ has no hope and shall be, stand condemned on the day of judgment. But I think knowing the audience, I think more importantly is this next offer. If you have sin in your life that needs confessing, you need prayers of encouragement, prayers of strength, now is the time. Won't you come and see every stand and sing the song that's been selected? <laughs>